Toronto Free Gallery, which is kind of one of the, uh, the satellite organizations that contributes to the 7A11D Festival, uh, was talking about how they could contribute. One of the things we talked about was how nice it would be to have the possibility for uh, kind of larger public to have the kind of close dialogue with artists that, that we get, you know, at the parties afterwards and kind of like the, 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 the time that's outside the actual performances and that often that's where a lot of the most interesting things happen and where you really uh, learn things about people. So we thought it would be nice if we had some kind of forum that would allow for that that and everything that's uh, that's that's happens here will also be put up on the web, so it'll be available as a kind of archive uh, for the future. Um, so, so we thought that this would be a great sort of contribution to the festival to add to it. I would just like to introduce your host for today's performance, our daily talk, uh, Berenice Hirschhorn, who is one of the artists, local artists, who is also participating in the festival, and she'll be performing what they. Saturday, Saturday the 30th at X Space. So, Bernice, I hand it over to you. Okay. Um, I might be a little clumsy with this microphone. Uh, what we're going to do, what we want to do amongst ourselves is have a conversation amongst ourselves, but that we share with you rather than have each artist lecture for half an hour about what they do and how they feel about things and then invite questions. We invite you to contribute to the conversation if someone is talking and you have um, something that you want to say or address or respond to, please do it at the time rather than hold on to the thought till the very end. For those of you who don't know their work, those few of you who don't know their work, I would like you to just open a little bit with who you are um, and just a very brief description of what it is exactly that you do. We'll start maybe with Helga. Helga first. <laughs> Helga has the microphone in his hands. And Should I start? Uh, yes. Okay. Hello. <coughs> uh, I think most of you know me, but uh, anyways, um, my name is Helge Meyer. Uh, terribly, I'm 40, and um, <laughs> I feel much older today after staying at Tanya's house until <laughs> half past three. But um, yes, my work is, I'm, I'm a teacher at, in Germany, in high school and in university. Uh, I wish I could be only a performance artist, but as you know, it doesn't pay the rent enough. So I'm happy that I can uh, teach and I try to teach as much performance art as I can in school and also in university, but sometimes it's not possible. And my personal work, uh, yesterday was a very important night for me because uh, normally I, I do not work solo. Um, I work since 19... 98 with Marco Teubner and the duo System HM2T and since uh, 2000 with my friend Jürgen Fritz and Black Market International and um, started another trio last year with Jamie McMurray and Julie Andre T. So um, I'm very interested in collaboration. If I work alone, normally I work with the audience and yesterday I didn't do it so much. So this was really something new for me and um, so I'm on a new way, I will see what will happen. Uh, uh, Jeffrey. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Bird. Oh, that's loud. Uh, I am from the US. I live in Iowa. Uh, I'm a teacher and an administrator at a university. One of my former students is over there. I'm very proud of Tara. Uh, <laughs> uh, my work um, has a lot to do with the relationship between real things and fake things. And also, I have this interest in trying to find uh, beauty in unusual or unexpected places. And the work that I'm going to be doing, like Helga, is a little bit different from me. It's new. Um, I think in the past, my work has been a little more uh, on the theatrical side. I would sing and dance and do some mo movement inspired by Bouteau. But the uh, piece that I'm going to be doing here, um, 
has a lot to do with working in an office, and uh, I've uh, found that I really love office supplies. <laughs> I mean, it's better than going to the, uh, you know, the art supply store. I love going to Office Max and uh, looking at envelopes, and uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm trying to find uh, beauty and order uh, in, in those things. Um, so uh, it's going to be a durational piece. That's also very, very different for me as well. So I'm, fingers crossed, I'm hoping it's going to go well. Okay, uh, I am Gwendoline Robin. Uh, I'm from uh, Belgium. Uh, I speak French and a little bit uh, English. Uh, I am before uh, artist visual, and uh, I begin a performance uh, two do since d 2000. Um, I before I make uh, installation and uh, with object and uh, body uh, object in space. And uh, in the performance, I, I want to tie, 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 this, you say it, to, uh, to make my body. And uh, for me, it's vic very difficult uh, to be with my body. And uh, I, I for, uh, for to try, my idea is uh, con one confrontation with my body and explosion. I need to to be uh, af afraid for uh, to be here in this space, and uh, now I begin uh, the maybe to, to tonight uh, and test uh, a new performance with uh, object, bo my body, and not uh, with explosion also. But, uh, not um, I test also the body and object and not explosion. It's very difficult for me. <laughs> But I, I am interested. I begin with uh, seeing explosion, and uh, I want to to arrive with uh, for the end with explosion, Bec because uh, I need to explode. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I like to uh, to the the smell smell in my body after. <laughs> Uh, what, Helga, what do you need for, to bring, <laughs> <laughs> like, now? <when> <laughs> not now, <laughs> not in general, but in, in performance, um, kind of, what's in it f for you, like, the, the smell of the, the gunpowder, the smell of the residue of the explosion is something that Gwendolyn needs, what is it that you get from the performance rather than what you give out? Um, for me, it's very much <clears throat> the contact to the audience. Um, I mostly start my performances with watching the people in the eye, and that's where I get the energy from. And um, I think um, I have a great interest in uh, communication, and uh, performance for me is the way to communicate with with actions and to start something in somebody else, hopefully, uh, that I have done. That, that is my starting point and my idea, and um, that I can communicate through this media medium performance art with, with other people. And mostly I also need uh, the, the heavy body work to, to feel my body. I have also a problem with my body, so I need, I need to... Um, endure situations. But yesterday was different. Um, but um, normally I try to push my body um, into the limits or, or through to the limits. That's what I need, to be exhausted after a performance. Yesterday I was more mentally exhausted and my voice is a little bit... Yeah, and I'm starting to work with voice. That's something I tried before because I'm a musician as well. But it didn't work. But now I'm starting to try to work with voice as well. Last night was the first time that you used voice in a performance? Not the first time, but um, I think I started last year or the year before in Boston when I did a performance in Mobius, um, where I absolutely didn't know what to do. They invited me last minute to do a night uh, there, and um, there I used 
voice, I think, the first time. In black market sometimes, but not, not really planned. So I think this is the third time that I also used the German language in a performance and not English. That's, that was new for me. Mm -hmm. And I like to break the, the whole dynamic of the performance with this, because everything was very slow, very silent, and then this German very hard. Eins, zwei, drei. Yeah. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> Jeffrey, what do I get? what's in it for what's you? What's in it for me? Uh, hearing this, you know, it makes me wonder if we all get into this because we don't like our bodies. <laughs> it, it, um, you know, the things that uh, we're already saying, I think I relate to, I like the idea of having some kind of interaction with the audience, but I also think that uh, when I'm performing, I, I reach this almost meditative state that seems uh, very uh, freeing, and uh, you, you want to take part of that back with you when you're not performing. You want to take that feeling back with you um, when you're not in front of an audience. Uh, I think performance has... has um, has helped me to be a better person, has helped me to be more confident. Uh, and I hope that, uh, even though that sounds really therapeutic, I hope the audience was getting something out of it after you know, all these years too. Um, I guess they'd tell me to stop doing it if they didn't get anything out of it. But I think it's, it's a kind of um, state of mind that happens when I'm performing that having it helps me when I'm doing everything else helps me to see the rest of life uh, in a different way. So what do you mean by a better person? <laughs> I think I'm more functional. Yeah. And uh, I'm probably a lot nicer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, performance art. <laughs> in, in, uh, in the aftermath, but not in the lead up to? Um, the lead, you know, I, I, I find myself doing a lot of things that really scare me. Uh, and a long time ago, it was something as simple as just taking my shirt off in front of people. And um, that doesn't really scare me anymore. And then it was singing in front of people, and that doesn't really scare me anymore. And now I think the thing that scares me is just how minimal this piece is that I'm going to do. And you wonder if it's enough. And you wonder if it's... Um, you know, you wonder if it's if it's something substantial, and that that scares me now. So I think I, I'm continually trying things that scare me. Uh -huh. Do you, do you do things that are physically painful? Uh, so, oh, uh, sometimes you know. Um, I'd you know I, I'd say it's a, it's a very strange kind of pain. You know, like. I had duct tape on my hairy chest and pulling that off, that was painful, or plucking all the hairs around my nipple, that was pretty painful. Uh, but not much of that, you know, occasionally. But uh, I think it's more of a kind of a psychological fear, that things that just make me afraid and uncomfortable. So you're, you're facing your fears in public? Yeah, I think so, yeah. But my fears aren't always the things that I think would scare most people. <laughs> That's probably true for all of us. <laughs> uh, uh, I have a question for Andy. When you performed last night and you used German counting at the end, did you recognize your voice when you were counting? Yes, a lot, because I was in this uh, aquarium and it was very loud. And um, I tried to push the limit of the voice, and that's the reason why I was very Tom Waits. To <laughs> but uh, yeah, of course, I recognize my voice. But it's not easy. I think this is, um, when I teach workshops, this is the most difficult part, to make the people use their voice. And I'm performing for some years now, but it's still, it's a point I have to go over to be able now use your voice. Be, because I think it's maybe the most personal part, the voice. Mm -hmm. I think so. You're using your voice sometimes. So the, I think it's a very, it's a step to it's, do it. It's a big step. You know, it's, it seems like that this set of muscles is, you know, has 
there's more anxiety right there than anywhere else, I think. Yeah. So about using the voice, um, so when, when you choose to use the voice and you're in a foreign place, how, how do you choose what to say? You know? Anybody? So yesterday it was just um, <clears throat> it was just about the number seven. The whole performance dealt with this number on different levels. I don't want to explain the work, but um, uh, and I decided to use the German language because um, I did this in Chile in a in a collaborative uh, work with Alexander Del Rey, Alex, uh, Alistair McLennan, and Marilyn Arsim, and um, it just came to my head I could use my German, and the people afterwards said that was a very interesting point. We couldn't understand what you were saying, um, but this German sounded so strange in this performance, and this was the decision to use the German language. And um, yeah, it's just by the moment, I think, that I decide. In, in, uh, in Chile, were you using, uh, were, were you speaking, or, or were you counting? Also uh, counting. Also counting, but you were talking. Yes, as well, yes, so yes. that you were communicating, but not communicating because you were speaking a, a language that... Yes, I was just talking in my own language. Yeah. And most of the time I don't, I don't say any words unless it's, you know, a, a snippet of an aria from an opera and then it's in Italian. And, and you sing? Yes. Do you sing also? Okay. Not in performance. <laughs> Not in performance. <laughs> I once tried, but it didn't work. Do you sing? Uh, do you sing in in performance? Do you speak at all? And I talk of uh, singing, singing never in my in the performance, but I I learn for the for the voice. But uh, I don't know uh, if uh, I can one time uh, to try uh, for the performance. But just uh, I have uh, one time in collaboration about uh, for the performance with a musician compositor, because for me uh, the the explosion is lack of voice. But my voice is explosion, and the musician compositor will uh, sing and uh, play the trombone. I don't know. In English, but Trum trombone, trombone, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, they are um, in a dialogue with a voice and uh, explosion. Uh huh. But it's not and my voice. Uh, and but you study, you study. You said you study voice, or or maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, no, but it's uh, it's not uh, the the, uh, the singer, but um, I don't know the the. It's a method method of. Uh, for um, just sort sortir, just sortir the voice. Uh, project. Yeah, the voice. project because my my voice uh, is very, uh, uh -huh. and uh, I learn for. Uh -huh. uh, that's interesting. With the position so and uh, uh -huh. I don't know. Uh, oh, oh, enfin, des trucs, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so you you learn to project your voice, but you yes. don't use your voice, but you use the power of that breath in mm. your performance. Yes, because, um, yeah. enfin, not for my respiration, but uh, I, I am very interesting for the, the puissance of uh, power. power, yes, yeah. for the respiration, but uh, not my respiration. May, yeah. Maybe in, in, in one day, uh, I can. I'm always interested when I speak with other artists or invite them. I, I'm wondering who, who, at, at what point would you say a performance was uh, good? So what is a good performance for you? When? When you do it? Sometimes you have a feeling it was not so good, it was good. But at what point would you say, yes, this performance was good for me? Maybe it's difficult to answer. Mm -hmm. Because I'm interested, because every performance artist has a different approach. 
in Paytech I'm interested what is your dream what you, what are you longing for in fact what what you what you try to achieve and I know I'm probably not to answer this question but I'm interested in this because they're so different people different approaches different ideas of what can happen during the performance for me it's um it doesn't I, there is nothing I could uh, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, I lost <laughs> the, the English word. Describe, describe. There is not one performance I could describe. This is the perfect performance, but when I perform and I have the feeling that everything falls like in, uh, I don't know the English word for this, machines that go like gears. gears. Yeah, yeah, like gears. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like when, I, <laughs> when I have this feeling, then this is a good performance for me. When I, when I have the feeling that I'm from the beginning till the end in a very present concentration and that I'm not out and thinking, oh, oh I have to change the diapers of my little girl, um, so that I'm really from the beginning till the end concentrated. It's not so necessary that everybody comes after the performance and says, oh, it was a wonderful work. Of course, this is wonderful, but that's not the point. Even if nobody comes, and I feel it was a good performance because I was there and I gave the whole concentration to this thing, then it was a good performance. It's not so much about content, it's about the feeling I want to have in a performance. Yeah, I would agree with that completely. Getting to that, that meditative state where I know everything that's going on, but uh, I'm, I'm also immersed in it. And I think that's when I know it was good. I mean, nothing's ever absolutely perfect. And I think if I ever made a really perfect performance, it might, I might stop. Uh, because what's wrong is the thing you work on the next time, or that's the thing that becomes the seed for the next piece, I guess. Uh, yes, uh, me, uh, uh, when uh, I, well, I. So she's saying that in most of her performances, she knows the beginning and the end. But uh, what is very interesting to her is when something surprising happens during the performance and this she's going to take <coughs> in and kind of try to follow it somewhere else. Uh, and kind of after, uh, ah, yes, this moment, uh, I want to, uh, for an other performance, uh, take uh, this moment and uh, for, for continue to evolve with this moment. Every time I discover something else, but when I have not, uh, je n'ai pas toujours cette découverte uh, dans toutes les performances. So the, those little discoveries are usually material for the next performances, but they don't always happen. I understand that you um, teach pyrotechnics to children, oh. and uh, I find that very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> I, I find that very, very interesting. I like uh, to to work with the children because uh, we have uh, it's forbidden <laughs> normally it's a little bit uh, else it's dangerous and blah 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 but uh, when I work with with uh, avec les enfants uh, c'est vraiment um, apprendre à, à construire une idée it's really learning to build an idea mais ils sont vraiment très concentrés sur uh, Créer une sculpture, enfin un, un, un dessin, et après on, on met les explosifs. So mm. kids are very concentrated in building a certain sculpture or drawing, and after that they put the explosives. Oui, ce serait gai de voir petit à petit l'excitation qui vient de, de, de plus en plus grande. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she loves to see how excited the kids get when the sculpture is getting built, and they know that soon they're going to put the explosives <laughs> in there. I actually, I didn't introduce Claudia Whitman, who is a uh, personal translator for <laughs> Gwendolyn today. In what context are, are these children's workshops? Do you go into a school, or do parents sign up their children to blow things yes, up? Yes, I go. I started in a festival for the children, for a festival where there were many uh, beaucoup d'ateliers pour enfants différents et j'ai proposé un atelier pyrotechnique 
et euh, English Creek. Et euh, after English School, there are, man, there are now many uh, English school. And uh, also in my um, my mother, uh, my mother, my mother, uh, make also uh, not pyrotechnic atelier, uh, but uh, she was do it, drawing and uh, and uh, ma mère oh travaille aussi avec des enfants et elle a oui. et uh, donc j'ai uh, les enfants de les ateliers de ma mère quoi aussi. So she started, in, she started in festivals for kids, where there were a lot of kids, and she offered a pyrotechnic workshop on the streets. And then a lot of schools asked her to go. And actually her mother is also teaching drawing, uh, so they share the kids, basically. But mais, mais beaucoup de parents uh, sont demandeurs de, de ce genre d'atelier. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, a lot of parents are very interested to sign up their kids for those uh, ah, workshops. <laughs> In Belgium. In Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, but the last, uh, when I, je reviens, I have a performance in Belgium. Et, uh, I, I invite my filleul, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Godfrey. Godfrey. Yes, uh, he has uh, eight, eight years. Et he performs with me. Uh, ah. So when she goes back to Belgium, she's going to perform. Yeah. And she's invited her eight years old called Godchild to perform with her. It's my first time. First time. First time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 have, have, have you done similarly transgressive workshops with young people? I know you, wor you work with young people, you teach high school. And do you, how do you, ch do you challenge your students? Yes, <coughs> because um, they treat me, uh, I'm the crazy teacher who's naked in the internet. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so that's, for me it's all the time a challenge to get into a new class and look at the faces and try to find out who saw me naked from these people. Um, I was actually very surprised that my headmaster accepts all of this but, and that no parents came up until now and say, uh, we think it's very strange that you are teaching our children, but it doesn't happen so far. I just teach naked, it saves a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but um, seriously, um, teaching is, um, is a big responsibility, mm -hmm. and I teach art and theater, so we, we have a new subject that's called uh, Darstellende Spiel, which means um, theater play or whatever. You can choose between music, art, and theater, and you have to ch uh, choose two subjects. And um, for me, it's very important really to, uh, to try to, to give something to the people that they make up their own mind. It's not so important that they learn skills in my, in my classes, because I, I cannot paint, I cannot draw. I'm a performance artist, and but I have an idea about art, and I try, even if they are small, to discuss with them their idea and to see what they are able to do, and to guide them in a in a direction, but not teaching them skills. I think um, I had a very good art teacher at the same school, and he was like this, so I want to keep on with this tradition, and this opened up a whole world for me because I had to find out what I am really interested in. And he was just guiding me and uh, giving me books and showing me things like Beckett and all this stuff. And so he was just clicking on the right spots. And I hope that I do the same. And um, sometimes I try to teach performance art if it's fitting in the curriculum. Because we have in Germany, you know, we have a lot of rules. And we have to follow these rules. But this school is quite open. And so I try to go between these rules and uh, try to challenge them. Yeah. So what would you normally be teaching? Normally I would teach like uh, the, the uh, it's difficult for me in English, that the, how are the colors connected in this color mm -hmm. circle and uh, 
teach perspective drawing, I have to do this, but I cannot even see three-dimensional because I only have one eye. It's very difficult <laughs> <laughs> to judge the, the, the things. That, oh, yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good. <laughs> it's, that's always, when I have to teach this, that's the most horrible part because I, I have to fake. <laughs> but because I can't see what they are doing. It, it looks, yeah, it should be three dimensional, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also some things like impression, impressionistic painting and all this stuff. So really, art, general art. But I try, as I said before, to, to do something. Sometimes I let them write about um, uh, pictures or make a performance out of uh, images or write poems. And um, so I try to, to do something else as much as I can. But of course, I have to write examens and all this stuff and give grades. And that's the worst part. Well, I teach at a university, and a lot of our university students are on the career path to be art teachers themselves. And um, more and more and more, I'm happy to see that those new, younger teachers are going out there to uh, include ideas about performance in the classes that they're teaching in elementary school and in high school. Uh, the elementary kids seem to be able to get, you know, get to it much quicker than the high schoolers. Um, but I think ultimately, what I would like to think of as a goal for education is to get to a point where when a teacher sees a student blow up some cow shit, the teacher says, I think you're going to be a performance artist. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a way of thinking, and it's, it, it's, um, it isn't um, a way of thinking that's about rules all the time or... Uh, having unique skills. It's a way of looking at the world that I think is very valuable and I, I'm glad to see that the teachers that I'm teaching are going out there and you know carrying this message forward. I would like to add something. I'm also teaching um, four hours at the university teachers who become art teachers and that's really shocking for me because these young mostly girls are coming there and they have no idea. They have absolutely no idea. They had a very very bad art education. They, uh, when I asked them, uh, do you know Joseph Beuys? There was one hand raised up in 45 people. And um, it was really shocking. And I, I teached a contemporary art course where we discussed uh, one um, artwork each uh, 90 minutes. And they have no idea from contemporary art. I think their, their knowledge ends somewhere two or three centuries ago. And they have no critic view on anything, and that's really shocking. So um, when I think that these people will go back to high school and be my colleagues and teach young children, it's, it's horrible. I don't want my children to be teach art by somebody like that, painting mandalas or things like this. <laughs> it's really, some people do it. They bring copies from mandalas, and today we make nice mandalas. Here, I gave you some copies. Now you can choose whatever color you like. Yeah. That's it's stupid. Yeah. But stay in who the is, line. Who is Joseph yeah. Boyce? Yeah. <laughs> what, what question? Who is Joseph Boyce? Ah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Joker. No, but it's really, it's shocking. And I think if, if nothing happens, then uh, in Germany, it, it, it looks really dark for our, t for our teachers. Nobody knows. No, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to add this. It's, it's, it's you know... Um, so much about so much of what education seems to be about is uh, stressing these kinds of practical skills and really enforcing uh, that onto the students, the young kids, um, and they, you know, it, it sort of um, zaps their spirit. You know, over time they just everything becomes so mundane, and uh, I, they don't seem to realize that you need these kinds of thinking skills, creative skills, mental skills, not only to, you know, solve problems, but also just to make life better. And, and that kind of quality of life stuff is uh, uh, getting harder and harder to, to make people believe it's valuable. It's a kind of governmental um, 
program, I think, and probably internationally, but I can't speak for international situations, but I sense it in certain places where education is about getting people into jobs to serve the economy, and it's not about the individual's freedom or consideration of life. Or, uh, you know, what's in the creative process is so much faith, the individual's faced with the mirror of, of themselves that they have to deal with, and I think that that's been missed so much in the idea of trying to create and solve problems. In Germany, uh, I don't know, I think you don't know this, we had uh, 13 years of education in high school and now they um, uh, uh, cut one year and we have only 12 years. And you cannot imagine what these children have to do in these 12 years, especially in the, in the last two years. They have no times for anything anymore. And of course the teachers, they push the subjects through like they are filled up like a machine, these children. And it's, it's really, it's horrible. And uh, for me and some of my really, um, mm, of the colleagues I like, we try to do something else and try to give them some ideas and try to, to lower the, the speed a little bit because this, they come in the morning and then it's until four o'clock, it's like this, 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 and then homework, homework, examines. And they are kids, they have no time for football or whatever. A lot of kids told me they, they started with an instrument or something <clears throat> and now they have to stop it because they don't have time anymore and they don't even have time to see their friends. And I think it's really, it's getting worse. And I have two children and for me it's, it's really, it's horrible that, that we do this because uh, it's not just filling these people up, they have to, have to have time to critically think about the things we try to teach them and that's, that's really a problem. Yeah. I think in our days we have a big, big, kind of uh, oh, did I take the um, yeah, yeah, we, we have a lot of performance art events going uh, in all museums and everywhere in all over the world and so but uh, I think in this uh, scenery in this scene where we are it's an off scene no? it's, a, it's off scene little money and everything uh, but we have a lot of performance art also coming now to the official places Like MoMA and wherever you know that. I really, I am not sure. So I'm asking you, do you think it's helpful for the idea and the movement of performance art that we have this big event? Or do you think it destroys the whatever original idea of performance art if it goes too much to the whatever maybe market or what, what, what it can be? Because I discussed this also with a lot of friends, and I think there's a lot of different meanings about that. Uh, par exemple, uh, moi j'ai vu, vu l'exposition uh, Marina Abramovic au MoMA, et je voulais voir pour, uh, pour voir si uh, le fait de refaire des performances uh, juste pour montrer uh, ce qui était fait, c'était intéressant et pour moi j'étais vraiment euh, c'était plus de la performance les, les, la trace vidéo ok mais euh, que on refasse des performances de Marina Abramovic avec des autres c'était des tableaux euh, juste des tableaux morts et c'était plus la performance et... so she is talking about this exhibit of Marina Abramovic's work at the MoMA and she went to see it and she saw the reenactment of reenactments of uh, the performances and she said that this appeared dead to her this was not performance at all she was okay with the videos but not with those reenactments yeah. Oh, yeah and she was okay also with the residues and traces of her performances but not the reenactments i i don't think that um that <laughs> what Marina Abramovic is doing is performance at all anymore. But um, with this, I have a big problem with this MoMA exhibition. What I saw, it, 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 it's just shit of what I saw on TV. And, um, but I don't see so much that other big museums have this. What, what do you mean, for example? Like I, I, I see a lot of openings, for example. When they do uh, opening performance, they invite a performance artist to do it. You know, um, uh, Jonathan Mese in Germany, you know, he's very famous, uh, not only, but as well with his performances. Uh, John Bob, you know, he, he's a performance artist. He's one of the 
most well-known German performance, but artist in the moment. But I think it's a very different idea of performance art that these people are having because they are they are selling things, they are producing uh, products for the market, for museums and for they're producing pieces. I think most of us work differently. I, uh, maybe this is why I I don't have a problem. They can do this, but um, I don't think it helps us. It's it's another. It's a really a market what they are going to. Also, Abramovich is just doing things for the market and in the market. So. One way I think it's uh, important that performance is recognized at that level because it gives performance credibility. And it doesn't mean that individual artists have to buy into the marketplace. This happens in all kinds of art practices, in all kinds of disciplines. You know, people make art for different reasons. There isn't one art scene. You know, there are many parallel scenes, and I think that when I teach my students, I, I try to explain that to them, that there are many different ways that you can be an artist and function as an artist in the world. The only time I get upset with the uh, designating performance art people is like uh, on, on the CBC radio a few weeks ago, Dion Gomeshi was saying that Lady Gaga is a performance artist. Lady Gaga is a celebrity. She is not a performance artist, in, in my view. Marina Abramovich is a performance artist. Where she, you know, she is a performance artist. What she is doing now may not be interesting for some people, but but it is interesting for maybe not interesting for us, but it is interesting for other people, you know, who who uh, maybe were intimidated or don't want to come to you know, this part of town or, you know, and, and deal with boredom or, so I, I feel it's, it's, it's fine, you know. It, it's not, it's not, a, it's not changing the what, what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So the more the better, you know, and there's bad art, you know, like there's always bad art and there's good art and, and it's, it's better to have more art, whether it's bad art or good art, and then we can have a conversation about what we can do <coughs> I would say, if, if, um, you know, if somebody who doesn't know what performance art is um, learns that the Museum of Modern Art is presenting this stuff and that person is a little more knowledgeable, um, that's probably b better than worse because that person may, you know, end up on some arts board that gets to decide whether or not we get money. And I'd rather them have that idea that this is legitimate, uh, rather than them continuing to think this is just crazy. So uh, you know, I, I think it's it's a it's good and bad, but I figure, you know, if it, if if it legitimizes it, it's probably better than than bad. So I, I'm curious, and that level, bring it back around. All of you said you were doing something kind of new or a bit different here. And I was wondering if there's something about wh why did you feel that this was a good place to try something a bit different as opposed to do maybe what you might do at other places? And, and, and actually, I have a sort of a, a, a added point to that question because I was going to ask you how you know when it is time to move on to a new idea. So I think those two questions work together. Mais euh, parfois je suis invitée dans des festivals very officiels, <laughs> festival de danse of uh, Seattle pour une performance, and uh, the festival demande, uh, me demande one piece, cette pièce. Not, uh, je ne suis pas invitée pour une, en tant qu'artiste. So sometimes she's invited in very formal festivals where they ask her to show a specific piece. So she's not asked to go there as an artist, but she's asked there to show that piece. And uh, it's, it's just important because they are the money. 
but it's only for important <laughs> to go there for the money. But it's, it's, yes, uh, I need the money for pour chercher uh, dans the nouvelles performances. Ça c'est bien. So it's money to live, but also for research in art. But uh, now this festival of the uh, autre festival organisé par des artistes. Là, je sais qu'ils m'invitent pour moi, pour en tant qu'artiste. Ils me demandent jamais qu'est-ce que je vais faire. Et du coup, c'est vraiment important de faire beaucoup ce genre de, de festival pour me mettre, euh, enfin, mettre en, en forme, essayer des nouvelles idées. Parce que je sais qu'il y aura après un échange euh, qui pourra me faire évoluer. Quoi. Donc, euh so it is in festivals that are organized by artists that she's uh, definitely trying new things. And it is through those new things and the exchanges that she has with the artists there that she can learn something new and know where she's going. Yeah, and in those festivals, she feels that she's in, invited as an artist, so for herself, not for this specific piece that she has done in the past. For me, it's a similar, similar reason. Um, I knew that some friends and some colleagues are coming here um, with who I wanted to discuss a lot of things. And so I decided uh, some of them saw my work, so I wanted to present also to my friends and colleagues something new to talk about. And see how it works for me and uh, push me a little bit. But also I was in, in very um, um, long contact with Shannon and was discussing, discussing with her what is possi possible here. I think it's uh, sometimes necessary to know what is possible because when we work in countries like China or Philippines or whatever, there's not so much possible in, in kinds of technique and for me yesterday, this was one of the most complicated things I've done, even if it was only an aquarium hanging, but normally I'm, I'm just simple, putting my stuff somewhere and starting. But I knew Shannon was saying, yeah, we can do many things, okay, feel free, plan something. So this was a very good conversation that opened up my, my mind also, that I could think, okay, I can mix some ideas, and um, so it was really open, and this gave gave me the opportunity to think about something new because there was this openness. Thank you for this. Maybe this point of Shannon is Shannon Cochran, the artistic director of Bado. Yes, just also in these festivals organized by artists, we have the right to also, not to miss, but to, because for me, the performance is never missed, but to something that is very fragile and that can not function as we wanted. C'est pas un produit, c'est une expérience. So in those particular events organized by artists, usually the performance artists who come feel they have the right to try something that's way more fragile, vulnerable, uh, dangerous, um, because there is no sense of what is going to be good or bad, but there is a sense of what we get out of it. And yeah, and there is the possibility to take the risk that something goes wrong and doesn't function. I, I hope you didn't think I was being disrespectful by doing something new here. <laughs> uh, it, it just happened to be the idea that I'm most excited about right now. And um, that's, uh, that's, that's why I chose to do it. It's, it's, um, the, it's the one that I want to do. And uh, it seems that I should do it right now. And, you had some windows, and everything just fell into place. What about Serenity's question about when you know it's time to move on to something else? You know, it, 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 it seems like you get to a point where it, an idea is, um, uh, for, you know, for me, it's, it, the idea becomes less frightening. And so that energy of tackling something that's frightening is gone, and that's usually when it's time to move on, but almost always it has a very organic flow that something, something out of the last piece will lead to the next one. You'll find some part of that last piece that's just as exciting or scary and you, you, you take that forward. That's generally how it works. But I think it's a, a loss of this particular feeling that's exciting. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm together uh, with a woman, she's in fine art. And in fine art you have this thing to that it must develop, that it must be contemporary, you know? Uh, 
we do, I, I have the feeling that in performance art of everybody, but we don't have so much uh, this idea of contemporary. That, that means we can show a piece, per performance that could have been shown 20 years ago. It would not really make a, a, a difference because it's much more related to the body and the body don't change so quickly. So uh, my question is, uh, what is your personal idea of development in your art? Do you develop? Or is, is, is it uh, important for you? Or what is your pers personal development? You know, as fine artists here, you must always attach to the time. What is a contemporary question in art in the moment? And that, and you are not allowed, for example, to show something what has been shown by another person. And I think we are more and less free of this question. I saw 100 performances cutting the hair, 100 things drinking alcohol, and I like it. You know, everybody can do it if he do it in his own way. But then you can have the impression, oh, and that is often people come to me, performance art don't develop. You know? So, uh, do you develop your, and how? Maybe it's a stupid question. So. Don't excuse all the time for your questions, you. Uh, um, yeah. For me, um, the question is very good. Um, I think um, performance art deals with, with the elements space, time, body, and that's a constant question. But what changes is the context where you work in. So for me, it is not that I have the feeling I develop from performance to performance. I think I develop as a person because I learn to see more of, of your work and this brings me on as a human being, which is also more interesting in performance art than in other art forms because we have this direct exchange with each other and with the audience and with our own body. So it's more a personal development, but I, I'm not so interested in the question of if something gets higher or different or something. Mm -hmm. But of course, the context. When I work here, it's different than in Chile just one week ago. It's a total other context. So I have to see which, which way I can work there. And maybe this is a development to get more sensible for this kind of context. When I was like 25, I'm sure that I didn't have the same sensibility for context. Maybe this is the way performance art develops, that we, if we really take it serious, that we get a feeling for context. If you think about, say, the history of painting, uh, there are certain things that come up again and again different ways of, say, dealing with the still life. For a long time, people were very focused on mythology and retelling those stories over and over and over again. And I think with performance, there, there are certain things that will just come up. Um, as you said, sh 100 people shaving their heads. It's almost as if we're part of a tradition, even though we don't really think of ourselves as being people who are part of a tradition, that we have a kind of, I guess you would say, collective heritage of certain kinds of activities that will come up again. And as Helga was saying, you know, that the present moment when it happens again, the next time somebody shaves their head, um, I may not be there, but I might. Other people will be there. It'll be in a different place. This way of reviving something and making it live in the present, um, I think that's OK, and I actually think it's interesting. You know, I hope somebody shaves their head during this festival. <laughs> it, it's an Are oldie, it is an oldie but a goodie. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I f I'm fine with that. As far as the development, I, I th I'm thinking Helga just, re you know, he's echoing what I was saying earlier. I think this process changes you as a person. And uh, I, I want people to, the audience, I want the audience to experience this and take at least the potential for that kind of change back into their own lives, that they can change who they are, change how they think. Also, um, speaking of audience, I would like to know about your relationship with your audience, how that, um, how you relate 
with the people who are watching you and how they're watching you affects what you do and how you move on really to, to, to the next stage. <laughs> Helga well, can go first, but uh, I, I have a sort of a question because you, you, you Gwendolyn, were, um, uh, I think, more closely with the audience because you bring, you bring a, um, an excitement and, a dan and an actual danger to them. So at the beginning, she was talking about this fantasy that we have around fire, pleasure or desire, and uh, that might make us believe that we are closer to her through this. But she doesn't think that this makes us closer. It's just different. So in, the, in my work, I, I often invite the audience to really participate, so really be co-producers of the work. Um, there are some different series I did um, since 2000. Three, I do this um, closing exchange performance where I um, started with Marco, my partner, in the Philippines to exchange my personal clothes piece by piece with one person from the audience and drink a schnapps afterwards with them. That's the part I like the most. <laughs> uh, and uh, then take this clothes to the next place, so the totally new clothes from these people. And the people told me a story. I started with the person a story. And then the people told me the story of their piece. So I travel with these stories of the people. And it's, this performance is amazing because um, it's so less about me now. It's really about the people. And uh, when it starts, people are shy. But then this performance opens so much. And the people really take, take their part and uh, t tell these personal stories in this performance. And it's it's just it's just wonderful. I try to do this as much often as I can. This performance, and it's it's really, yeah. It's it's. I said before that I'm interested in communication, and this is a really very personal communication with these people. And wearing the underwear of some person who just had sex with her boyfriend that was really that was something when she said this to me, <laughs> and I had to put it on. But I had to do it. For God's sake. <coughs> so for me, um, the audience is really important. I couldn't do a video performance because um, there I could not get this energy. Even yesterday, it was really important for me to look at the people before and get this eye contact. And some people smiled at me and this gave me some courage. Some people were just like, <laughs> this gave me another kind of courage. So I will push you. So this, this is for me really important, the, the contact. And was there something else in the question? Uh, no. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think the energy of you know, working in front of a live audience is pretty important. Um, I, I want to just share this little story because I, I've, I'm always um, happy when I find that my work might have uh, touched people in a way that I was not expecting at all. And uh, a couple of years ago, I did a performance in Belfast, and at the end of it, I threw all these confetti stars over the audience. And uh, they were really, f you know, the, the folks that were running the show were really great at cleaning everything up. And so those stars were swept up. But the next day, I noticed that they had missed a few. and. There was a little girl there, and she was maybe about you know, six or seven years old, and she was going around picking up the ones that they had left, and she had them in her hand. And of course, she, hadn't, she didn't see the performance that I did, so she was picking up these little stars and putting them in her hand, and she looks up at me, and she goes, these stars are magical. <laughs> and I thought, that's great. <laughs> and I was really happy that somebody that I never thought it was going to, you know, I was not going to have a connection with, because of my performance, she, she got something out of it. So I that, those kinds of things made me very happy. On that question of audience, uh, I always think it's like in these kinds of events, we have two audiences. So there's the audience of most of us who kind of, we've heard of each other's names, or we've met each other at festivals, or we've seen, I saw your performance in Berlin, and I saw your performance in Thailand, and you know, uh, so we have a kind of, <coughs> 
what you were talking about earlier, I'm coming, I'm doing this in a way for my colleagues who I've met and, and they know something about my work so I have something new to tell them or I have something further to explore. And then there's this other audience of, we go to all these different countries and we don't really know the situation we're going into. But for me, it's always this question of, how am I, what, what could I possibly have to say to these people? I know nothing about this world. How can I learn enough about this world to know I'm not just speaking something that makes no sense whatsoever, that has no connection to them? And I'm wondering how you deal with that, that question of how, how do you keep it real to this, this moment? For me, it has something to do with research. Um, when I work with Marco, especially um, in this duo, we research a lot about this place where we are going to. And uh, sometimes we work uh, with some things that, that interests us there. And we hope that we can communicate on this level with the people. But um, I would like to say something that was really maybe the best or, or the most interesting thing I ever experienced so far. This was Kaori's <laughs> festival in 2001 from Kaori Haba from Japan. She invited um, four artists, Marco, me, Sylvie Coton, and uh, Chumpon Apisuk, to stay for two weeks in a small village in Japan. We were not allowed to bring a finished performance, and the, the villagers were cooking for us. We lived in this traditional tatami house and Kaori brought us to a home for um, mental people, um, a home for old people, uh, a children's, uh, a, um, a kindergarten, nursery school. So she tried to show us a lot about Japanese culture before we were developing a work. And this was a brilliant idea because the works we were doing were really related to what we experienced in these two weeks. And we really lived together, so there was no talking about art so much. It was really talking about the culture, eating with these people, learning many, many things. That was good, but I think we all have not so much time to do this all the time, and not so much money. But this was, it was a wonderful experience, because I had the feeling really, here I can work on something that is really only related to this special event. It's, I think it's really interesting. It's, it's, it's more interesting than just doing this, this uh, gallery hopping performance art presenting. I like to be there longer and experience something. Here it was a different thing. I, I told before what it was here, but in Chile it was good because we worked in Concepcion, which was really struck hard by the earthquake and many people died there. And we had some days um, to be there and talk to people who live there. So this was also interesting, a little bit short, but I think this is important to, to get a feeling or a little bit of knowledge about the people and the place. Oui, enfin, il y, y a juste une chose, c'est que avant, euh, avant cette répondre tout de suite à la question, c'est euh, c'était important euh, pour moi. So she's first talking about her relationship with the audience, and she says that. At the beginning of her work as a performance artist, she would do her work very quickly. So she would come on stage, mm -hmm. do her work, and then disappear. And through contact with <laughs> exploding, <laughs> 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 and it's through contact with the audience and hear, hearing what they had to say that she heard that she could actually. Those people were wanting to see her preparation for the explosions, and they were suggesting that she extends time and shows more, and this is what she's doing now. Et de, de faire confiance à juste aussi la présence euh, de l'être humain par mm -hmm. rapport à d'autres. Start to mm -hmm. trust just the presence of the human being mm -hmm. with other people. And uh, maintenant, quand je vais dans un autre pays, je, je ne vais pas, euh, je, je me dis que je viens faire confiance à, à juste, je suis uh, Gwendoline, et euh, face à d'autres personnes, mais de prendre le temps d'être là aussi avec une action, une action moins spectaculaire ou, et d'établir un, un, ce rapport-là avec les autres aussi, mais pas en fonction de la nationalité ou du pays spécialement euh, tout de suite. Quoi. So when she goes to a foreign place, 
she has the tendency to put a little less emphasis on something very spectacular, but trying to be with the audience as a human being, because we're all human beings, even if it's a foreign country. Hmm? Well, I think um, getting to have these kinds of exchanges, I feel very lucky because um, it's, it's good that there's this kind of openness amongst people when you go into a place they're curious about what you're going to do. You're curious about just how they live in a regular way every day. And that clash of what you're going to do, which is oftentimes uh, irregular with their regular, I find that very interesting. You know, that you come and you do these things and it's very bizarre and then afterwards you're just going to go to a restaurant and have a drink with them. And I love that idea of slipping in and out of that way of thinking, and really, you don't very much. You know, as you, once you're there to make art, you, you, you know, you you continue that, and I, I, um, I find it really heartening to know that there are people all over in the world that are interested in these kinds of things, and that, um, you know, I, I feel optimistic because of it. Uh, I hope you know, we can keep having these kinds of interactions and, and uh, that it spreads. Um, but there's something real fascinating, like I said, about the, the, the bizarre thing that you may do, and then 30 minutes later, you're sitting at a bar, and it's, it's not bizarre anymore, you know? And it, I, it's almost, uh, um, you know, a, a real intriguing part of it, yeah. Gwen Lynn is uh, performing tonight at Mercer Union at 8 o'clock across the street. And uh, Jeffrey is performing tomorrow. I think it's 12 to 7. Here from noon till 7. At, and uh, hope to see you all in all those places.